whenever I think about this, the big picture, I always come right back to you and your progress like <laughs> determines <laughs> how I feel we're doing in many ways because I mean, I got the soil thing. I understand the soil thing. I can teach everyone the soil thing, but it's right. your piece that is a, such a greater power leverage point that no one really knows about. And, oh. and I know that that, that movie came out uh, 2040. 2040. Yeah, so good. Oh, thank you. But I don't know if it's on the tip of every tongue and it should be. Oh, no, it, it's, it, it, it's kind of a sleeper film in the States. It did well here in Australia. But I think there's enormously greater potential as we go forward. And we're scaling by a factor of 10 this year. So it's um, encouraging. We survived the hurricane, uh, the typhoon, super typhoon Rye. And the platform was five meters below the surface. It wasn't damaged. And much of the seaweed remained on it, maybe half the seaweed. So uh, we have, you know, that's a key question. A key test was surviving that. And so we have a path forward that we can show to those that are helping us scale that this is gonna work even in the worst storms that we can envision. And that's critically important, I think, because everyone has these, you know, fears, I mean, legitimate fears, but Definitely. this this seems to be consistently, and, and, and let's like, you know, start over at the beginning with it, because I sure. know for so many people at this conference, they're yes. going to want to, to get all of the 411 on this because for me, it changed mm -hmm. everything. It, it gave okay. me great relief. It gave me focus. Right. And uh, it's the linchpin. So why, why don't you just start by sharing uh, what you do and, uh, and why sure. you do it? That sounds good. Well, uh, we've worked in soils and seas over the past decade. And initially, um, we identified soil amendments that could help people uh, to regenerate their soils and a combination of biochar, compost, microbial communities, all have been helpful in re regenerating depleted soils. And the path less taken was regenerating life in the sea. And so in many ways, uh, we are looking to um, enable that. In the last half decade, we've been developing marine permaculture to enable regeneration of kelp forests, of coral reefs, and those charismatic mega ecosystems that we depend on for our sustenance and so billions of people depend on it. And so we have identified a way to restore natural upwelling um, and enable uh, the kelp forest to return offshore and be able to provide the substrate, the deep water irrigation, get these kelp forests back on track and enable them to be the nurseries, if you will, for regenerating the sardines, the anchovies, the entire trophic pyramid that enables um, life to sustain and, um, and grow. And so it's really a regenerative approach for the ocean. And the first economic sustainability we'll think, we, we think will be at a hectare scale with the production of food products, feed and fertilizers that can actually help land agriculture. So it goes full circle from the sea back to the land and back to the sea again. Bill Mollison in the 1960s was inspired to create you know, and, and discover permaculture through the kelp forest of Tasmania. So that was the original inspiration half a century ago. The simple way of um, approaching it is that we have to have a substrate for the seaweed to hang on to, and then we need some deep water irrigation. And an easy way to do that is using uh, wave energy or marine solar energy to provide the energy needed to irrigate the kelp forest. And we've seen incredibly restored production in the Philippines, I would say um, four times the production of the surface irrigated seaweeds. And that really restores the production back to where it was in the 1980s and 1990s. And that's for 11 months of the year. These days, the Filipino seaweed farmers can only grow the high quality seaweed maybe five months a year. And then the water gets too warm, nutrient levels too low, and they've got to wait out and they don't have the sardine fisheries to keep them going anymore. So we're getting thousands of sardines around the marine permaculture, hundreds of tuna, dozens of dolphins, and we even had a whale shark come and visit and <laughs> spend three days with us last year. So it's nature's voting with her fins and she's saying, this is where it's at. And we're getting these kind of sardines that you see around the picture behind me of um, just an amazing abundance of life. We see similar effects off the shores of Tasmania as far south as Tasmania that we have, uh, 
uh, rescued the production of giant kelp offshore. And that was primarily by working, ironically, right next to some of the fish pens, where there's some nutrients coming off from the fish pens. So that was the first test. But we're now proposing this year to do the upwelling or the deep water ex irrigation experiment um, with those giant kelps and verify that it works from the tropics to temperate waters and that we can actually regenerate these seaweed forests. Am I right to think of it as an analogy that we have a lack of circulation like in a body and we're just bringing back circulation so those, those, those atrophying muscles and limbs don't die? Definitely. Another way of looking at it is um, there have been papers that came out just a year ago on the stratification of the ocean. And what that means is the top layers of the water get too warm, the nutrient levels get too low, the primary production goes away. Because if you don't have nitrate or phosphate, you don't get any plants and those plants stop growing. That The plants create 50 to 80% of the oxygen that we breathe. So most of the oxygen we're breathing is coming from marine algae. So if they're not breathing, I mean, those are the lungs of the earth. You know, it is, is really the ocean and in so many ways, uh, complementing um, the green algae that move to land and we call them land plants these days. But the ancient, you know, the ancestors were green algae and red algae and brown algae. And so we've got to get nature back on track. And that's all about restoring natural upwelling. And that's really one of the major inter interventions, I would say, that humankind has caused in the last century is this warming of the oceans and stratification, deoxygenation, and ultimately, you know, this is how 96% of all marine species perished during the um, Permian mass extinction. So we've seen this video before. It was 250 million years ago and it happened. The earth system is perfectly capable of doing it. So every marine permaculture we put in the ocean is staving off the Permian mass extinction one hectare at a time. And that's what we can do for our planet and for our ocean is actually regenerate life in the ocean and get a sustainable yield, which is advocated by, um, you know, Dave Holmgren and, and others who write, help to develop uh, permaculture as a field. And so Dave has helped us to uh, apply the dozen permaculture design principles to the marine environment. And we're looking forward to publishing that paper this year with the help from uh, Scott Spilius, at uh, University of Queensland. Wow. Wow. So, and the and the, what are the relative costs for all this? Sorry, the relative what? Costs for all this. Oh, I mean, different uh, areas it'll cost different things, right. but is it is it expensive or? You know, the first hectare will cost three million, and we expect to get at least a half a million in seaweed and fish each year. But by the time we build a half a dozen hectares we should get the cost, the capital cost down below a million. And again, at least half a million in seaweed and fish and maybe more, you know, uh, that's, that's the upside. So these systems are gonna pay for themselves and we're gonna launch the marine permaculture industry uh, one hectare at a time, starting in the Philippines, but we'll deploy them in Australia. Uh, we're hoping to get back to Indonesia where we did our first tests and ultimately all around the world from the tropics to temperate kelp forests. It's so encouraging that you're going to be able to outcompete other methods and lengthen growing seasons and help the earth at the same time as economically these areas that are literally it's it's the ceiling that they're hitting for themselves and so true. families and the potential for their children and you're opening that door. I feel like what what do you think is going to happen and where do you think that give is going to be where it starts to get momentum and just take off? Well, I think after we do a few hectares, uh, the, the sustainability, economic sustainability will be there, but it goes beyond that because there's a quarter million seaweed farmers in the Philippines who are on the front lines of climate disruption. They can grow five or six months a year as it is now. And you know, super typhoon Rye came through last month and destroyed almost all of those seaweed farms in the central Philippines. And Ours was an outlier. We told our, our colleagues and our partners that our platform survived just five meters below the surface and they were blown away. Mm. They, you know, they hadn't seen that result before. And that means we're on the right track 
not only with the means of production by restoring natural uplying and restoring uh, the deep water irrigation that's needed for these seaweed farms to do well, but when it comes to um, subsistence farmer resilience, they're gonna get more and more and more of these hurricanes coming through with the warmer waters and they've got to be resilient to them. And we've got a recipe that's going to enable them to ride out the worst hurricane that we've seen and be able to uh, be able to thrive instead of just barely survive. I mean, we have 2 million people still without power in the central Philippines with limited, in fact, I can't even I, you know, get back in touch with some of our um, staff who are on the island of Bohol because they still don't have any cellular communications. So mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about moving from disaster relief to recovery. You know, uh, four out of five of the coastal buildings on our site where we, that we were leasing were wiped out. So uh, we're working with the owners to try to rebuild. That's recovery. And then ultimately resilience, because we've, we've found the recipe for surviving those hurricanes, and that is lower those platforms, get them deeper, and the seaweeds can survive. And that's our resilient message is to build more of these platforms so that the subsistence seaweed farmers of the Philippines and 2.8 million seaweed farmers in Indonesia can be confident that they can build for the future. And that's really what we're aiming to do. I love that. And since carbon is sequestered at, you know, they, they say at a, an order of magnitude higher than land plants by, by aquatic plants, those seaweeds mean that they're not just on the front line of climate change and feeling the effects, mm -hmm. they're also on the front line of making that change themselves. It's true. And we're estimating that for every square kilometer of seaweed forest, um, it, it can fix up to uh, 2,500 tons of carbon per um, square kilometer per year. Now, that's about 15% more than even an Amazon tropical rainforest. And so it's amazing you know, that you can have such a productive ecosystem in what would otherwise be a mostly empty ocean. So we can go to parts of the ocean that are mostly empty from the blue ocean tropics to you know, offshore uh, Australia and it's blue water, there's hardly anything there. Amazing. And we can uh, create, we can regenerate an island of life which offshore regenerates the kelp forest ecosystem services that have been lost. And we've lost a thousand square kilometers off Western Australia, a similar amount off Eastern Australia and Northern California has seen a loss of over 90% of the Neurocystis kelp forest in Northern California. And those are just examples we've looked at. How many kelp forests have we missed? In, in fact, I found a map from the US Geodetic Survey dating back to 18, 58 are thereabouts that showed a river of kelp almost a kilometer wide going from central California all the way to the Mexican border. And that river of kelp was continuous. In fact, it was a hazard to navigation, which is why it was on the map. And we, nobody alive today has a living memory of that kelp forest that existed a century ago. Which means that the amount of carbon that we actually can take in and the planets give, like the engine of the carbon cycle is so much more massive than we actually have been able to document. It gives me great hope. It does, it gives me great hope as well, because if we use, you know, there's hundred million square kilometers of subtropical ocean separating you and me right now in the Pacific. And if we use less than 1% of one ocean, we'll be feeding the planet, regenerating life in the Pacific, and we'll be sinking gigatons of carbon. And, and in this scenario, we empower the people that are actually directly affected by this and disempowered by it. So you're directly going to the source of the problem and the multivariate problem, the holistic problem, and you're fixing it with this one inexpensive, I mean, it really is inexpensive when you think about the services, not just all the products. And it's amazing that you've made up this, this, you 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 created an entire industry. And that's our, that's yeah. our, that's our aim is to really launch marine permaculture and enable seaweed farmers from across the, the world to um, effectively build a hectare 
grow it and sustainably sustainably cultivate seaweed for food, feed, and fertilizer. I mean, it's beyond superfood status. I take a little seaweed every day and look what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, so, so what do you see for the future? What's, what's your, your most hopeful vision for the future? Well, right now we are fundraising to um, enable the disaster relief that we need in the Philippines and to build that first tenth of a hectare stepping stone to an economically sustainable hectare. And our goal is this year in 2022 to build and demonstrate that tenth of a hectare stepping stone. And then we have pledges as soon as we hit that milestone. We've got our first million of three million that we need to build the first sustainable hectare. So we'll be doing a big crowdfunder for that later in the year. And um, you know, it's meant to build that successful, that sustainable business model and then enable people around the world to deploy their own hectare. It's like, it's like the Oklahoma land rush, you know, where you could just go out and get, get yourself a hectare and start growing seaweed, except it's, the, in, the, it's, it's in the ocean. And the ocean, um, you know, we intend to protect people's rights to build marine permaculture vessels. And like any sailing vessel, you can register it and you can operate it. And that's gonna be the model for the future. I can't wait for it. Oh. Oh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. This, this, this is why I, I can sleep like a baby at night, because I know that this is possible, that this, this future is possible, and that, that you are working on it and making it happen. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You know, it takes the regenerative efforts of our entire tribe to uh, make this succeed. And that's really uh, what we need to do in the next few years is really show that it works and then scale it exponentially. And that's the kind of viral propagation that we need to do to, to regenerate the planet. Is there a mailing list that we can sign up for so that we're ready for that promotion? Yes, it's right at the climatefoundation.org. Um, we are doing a, a crowdfunder on the disaster relief recovery and the 10th of a hectare stepping stone right now. It's doing dollar for dollar matching. And so at climatefoundation.org, you can check that out. Uh, and you can also um, get on to our newsletter. And we look forward to engaging with all of you to enable uh, the, the sustainable future for the oceans as well as the soils. Wow. Thank you so much. Oh, my Everyone pleasure. Everyone go to the website, sign up and, and take part in this. I'm going to be promoting this. So if you're with me, you're going to hear about it again. But this, this is it. This is the linchpin for, all, for everything. Well, thank you so much, Matt. We really appreciate your support and looking forward to participating in this exciting uh, get together to really understand what the potential is uh, for our regenerative future.